the RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com. And you're welcome to the RT Rugby Podcast. As we discussed the weekend just gone, we have Munster against Connacht this weekend. Very much to look forward to and some very frustrating news as well if you are a Munster fan in particular. Before I get into that, uh, start on a positive note, as I always like to do on the RT Rugby Podcast. World Rugby has just announced changes to the law which will allow all players, that's men and women, to wear leggings and tights in rugby matches. So Bernard Jackman, when you're making a comeback, you can put on the pair of tights that you've been desperate to do stuck in on the pitch. How do you feel about that? Uh, look, between that and the, the fact that they're talking about banning red and green jerseys, uh, um, I wonder how they much to be doing, to be honest. Uh, I just, yeah, look at, um, I, I saw I saw it yesterday and um, I wonder yeah. if there's not more, more, more important things to be looking well, at. Well, you know, it gets cold on the rugby pitch, Birch, you know, those wingers standing out yeah. there, a pair of tights, Donald Lennon, Cork Collins standing on the wing, you know, the rain Gee. rushing down, a pair of tights will do I can. Job. I can give you one guarantee here, Hugh. The sale of tights in the Munster area is not <laughs> prone to go through the roof. I'm quite happy with that well, prediction. Well, I could, I could say... I might have got a better performance out of the con lads on Saturday, though, Hugh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that was what the key element was missing with. A good pair of tights. And, well, in fairness, 48 seconds, and you're nothing if not predictable. We won't, <laughs> talk, about the cook- we won't talk about the cookie second half collapse and yeah. three yellow cards. No right. room for cynicism in rugby. <laughs> Listen, there was a good only- sign when you can win with 12 men in 40 minutes of rugby, though. You know, that's all you need to put a team away. Yeah, I think only three cards of the cookies is actually pretty impressive, to be honest with you. Anyway, we'll get back to the IL a little later on. Uh, look, I, I want to take it down a bit, lads, because, Donald, um, the unbelievably frustrating and disappointing news, uh, which you, you were on commentary for the Scarlet's game on Sunday afternoon, and I was listening back to it, uh, and you went, oh, God, as, as, as Jorge Snyman limped off the pitch, what looked to be a, a pretty bad injury. It's turned out he's ruptured his cruciate again for the second time in the space of uh, two and a half years. It's absolutely incredibly disappointing, isn't it? It is. Look, I couldn't believe it during that match. And um, uh, like I missed the incident when it happened. But when I saw uh, Tygo Sullivan, the, the, the monster doctor, just uh, helping him off, you knew immediately there was a sort of a little part of me looking at it limping. His right knee was strapped. And I was trying to tell myself, oh, God, maybe it's his left knee. Um, but it wasn't. And, uh, you know, look, the first thing I got to think of here is the player. I mean, you go through the, the rehab that he has done. It was almost back last June, and then he had that incident around the, the barbecue in CJ Stander's house. It's just been one setback after another. Um, I think it's more cruel when you're a player like him, when you're, you're living away from home, you don't have that family support. And I always make the point in terms of, uh, uh, particularly for, for overseas players, you know, you can be welcomed into the group, you can be part of the setup, but when you spend most of your day uh, with the physios and in the rehab area and everybody else is preparing for a match and you're not part of that match. You don't feel part of it until you're actually out there. Uh, you were there when he came off the bench in the, the opening game of the, of the URC against the, the Sharks and you could feel the warmth within the crowd. First time there was, I think, 12,000 people back in Thoman Park. None of them had seen him in action in the flesh. The response from the crowd, he came on, there was a liner on the far side of the field uh, the field just under our commentary position mm. and the, the, the smile on his face as he was running across the pitch and you could just feel that he had waited for that moment he had uh, heard about Thoman Park and the buzz of the crowd obviously because of the pandemic he didn't experience any matches with people in there and uh, you know he goes on from there second game he gets that slam dunk try against the Stormers and you just felt this guy he's part of the new regime, this guy is a, w- potentially the missing ingredient. So look, for what happens, I mean, there is precedent in this in sport. There's, you know, I was reading a lot of, uh, of American footballers. We've had it in the, in the GA ourselves here, Colin O'Neill and Cork. I think Marcel could see up in Ulster had a, a similar experience. But it's horrible, um, both yeah. for, but, but especially for the player himself. I think the worst part from his point of view, uh, Birch, is that he knows exactly what's ahead of him. The first time you do it and you go through a lengthy rehabilitation, it, it, it can be tedious and monotonous, but I guess it's, it's, it's all new in that, you know, for a player who hasn't kind of done something similar before 
and you just get through it. He knows exactly what's ahead, how much time he's going to have to work on this, how much rehabilitation he's going to have to do away from the pitch. And that, the mental side of this, more than the physical, is probably what's going to kill him. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's horrible. And I think, look, at the, the medical system in Ireland, um, in all the four provinces and at the IRFU, is, is, is top end. And I, I think, I know speaking to Dan Levy around, you know, how they managed his rehab, they basically broke it down into, into little blocks. So, you know, four weeks of this, then a little, a little treat, a little reward, you know, a week off, go somewhere else. Also, going, doing your rehab in different places. You know, so going into uh, you know a week in Man City or somewhere like that, or or with an American team, just to try and it's not that the treatment's going to be any better. It's to actually deal with the the mental fatigue and and trauma, particularly as he goes into you know year two of effectively what's been a continuous injury. You know, you, you can say so. I'd imagine Munster will make sure he gets some time in South Africa. Um, you know, obviously the other thing is what's his contract future like. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I would be in favour of, of trying to keep him, to be honest. And I know some people will say that's madness, but you know, uh, I, I just think if you've invested two years in someone like him, who's a who's a world beater, the market for second rows at the moment is off the scales. That that's where that's where tight head props were three or four years ago. Every single club who have ambitions to win trophies are looking for someone like RG Snyman. So. You know, He's only twenty six, Birch. He's oh, only yeah, twenty six. No, 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 I've no doubt he'll come back, but I, yeah. I, I would love to see him. I would love to see him being able to come back and do what Munster, you know, signed him to do, what he obviously wants to do, regardless of the fact that you know it's probably a risk uh, in terms of his injury profile. But I, I, I genuinely would love to see him try and be able to do a deal with him to tie him down, so he knows going into this rehab, you know, where his future is. Which uh, it, it's 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 not a simple thing to pull off, but. Certainly for me, I, I think Munster with RG Snyman um, are going to be far, are far more likely to win trophies. And I think from a human side of things, if it was possible, I think it'd be the, a brilliant thing to do to show that there's that uh, care. The, the care is there. It's just whether they can actually convince the, the bean counters um, that it's worth the risk. Uh, Wes, put your business hat on then for a second uh, as the only one of the three of us with the Masters and anything. Um, what? Just from a business point of view, just the same one as me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, 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 got a, I got his. a pass. I got a pass. He bought his. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you know, does it make business sense? Do you think for Munster to, to look into keeping um, Snyman, given what he's likely to cost? I guess, and second of all, the risk, as Byrne just mentioned, with him coming back to poor fitness. I was thinking about it yesterday, actually, and like obviously, it sounds crass, kind of talking about that off the bat, because as the lad said, the sympathy is with him. Um, first of all, and with the, the management and the team, it must be so frustrating to kind of spend years assembling something and, and kind of seem to be thwarted by kind of one errant thing going wrong almost every year. And But I suppose, look, ultimately, you do have to look at it financially and, like, it's been a massive investment to get 70 minutes of rugby in two years. No one's fault, you know, very unlucky. Can you justify that again? You know, I mean, I, I see Birch's logic and I, I know what he's saying about the market for second rows. I, I wonder what the market for him is when there's no evidence over the past two years of, of what form he's in, of what condition he's in, um, of how he recovers from this uh, from this injury. But I think he's been well looked after in Munster. I'd imagine, I'd imagine there's a bit of bit of loyalty on both sides at this point that you know he's been well looked after well played well paid while not playing and they've been you know desperate to get him on the field so i'd be hopeful that they maybe will work something out whether it's uh you know it's obviously going to be contingent on how he recovers and whether it's you know incentivized pending medical results who knows but also i don't know the key thing here is that this like this these kind of guys don't go, come on very often you know he's and he is still only 26 years of age He's not going to have a huge amount of rugby in the last two years, so that might prolong his career. And as Bernard says, the market value of a guy like Snyman when he's fit is off the scale now in terms of popularity. So sh should they be they should they be looking at, at keeping Snyman on another contract? I, <clears throat> I have no doubt that's exactly what the coaches and the, the management want to do. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of, yes, of course, look, before anybody else would sign him, he'd have to go through rigorous medicals and there is a risk element as a consequence of what he's gone through so surely the best people to assess what his capacity or his capabilities will be at the end of that entire rehab people are the people who have been working with him over the past two years 
Uh, I would take Birch's point about a, a degree of loyalty that's there. From my understanding of, of Snayman, he looks this ferocious beast on the field, but he's supposed to be a, an absolute gentleman off the field. He's mixed in very well with the, with the Munster squad. And you would feel that, you know, there should be some element of loyalty from him there. The only caveat I think that will be there is people don't realise there's a massive amount of financial pressure coming down the tracks on all four provinces. Uh, as we know, um, you know, given the issues around the pandemic, uh, like they've accumulated huge losses over the past number of years. Munster, I know, are under severe financial pressure. They're being almost micromanaged by the RFU at this stage. So therefore, um, you know, a, 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 an, is, an issue like Snayman and the lack of return on that investment is something that the bean counters may look at on one side. But purely from a rugby perspective, what he has to offer, given the time that will be invested in him by the time the two years is up, I think they have to move heaven and earth to make sure that he stays there. Because um, it just sends the right message to everybody. that they, He's part of a journey. Munster have been making incremental improvements. They're still a bit away maybe from the finished article. But this guy is going to play a major role in terms of maybe getting over that last hurdle. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be another season before we find out uh, if that's what's going to happen in, in, in relation to Snyman. Um, so look, it's a no-brainer for me. They have to work together to make sure that he finishes this journey. Yeah, just on that, I, I think Donald's 100% right. The Munster will be in the best position medically to make um, you know, a, a decision on, on his likely future in terms of injury profile. But it's interesting. Every, every club will look at it differently, both from a medical point of view in terms of how sound that player is likely to be, but also you know, how much the coach is willing to push the medical team uh, to give a favourable uh, medical report. So, for example, Leone Nakawara... He signed for Munster in January or Ulster in January. Uh, his form was poor for Glasgow between January and June. He fails a medical in, in Ulster in June. So, you know, the, the, the man on the street would say, man or woman on the street would say, Jesus, he must his body must be shot. Uh, I, I was looking at Midi Olympic on Monday. He's in the uh, Midi Olympic team of the week for too long. You know, so um, what Ulster's physio or medical team felt around Leone Nakawara, which was, you know, his body's not ready to play. Uh, to play for Ulster, um, you know, Toulon's medical team passed him fit, and he's he's out there performing again. So it's very much, it's very much what you need. Um, and we all know in medical in medical world, second and third opinions can be can be vastly different. So I wouldn't write him off at all. Um, I just think it's going to be a, a big a big question mark for Munster um, around whether they can get it done. And I would love to see them being able to do it, even within the financial constraints, which I totally understand Donald makes, which are going to be very, very uh, difficult to uh, to keep everyone happy. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Good point, lads. And look, we'll wait and see what happens there. But Hugh, Hugh, the, Hugh the, the other point of it, that's probably the, the ultimate decider of it is going to be that any foreign signing, as we know, has to be sanctioned by the IRFU. They're very slow to allow a foreign player to extend a contract the idea being that you play your one run of a contract and that you have that time to bring through a homegrown alternative. I can imagine looking at Munster with fellas like Thomas Ahern, the thought was that Snayman would hold the place until more of their own came through. Yeah. So they're going to have to sanction it too. And as Donald says, if they're almost micromanaging finances at this point, it's not just about Munster. There's going to be a lot more other people involved in this decision and a lot more factors at play. Yeah, that's a fair point. And, and all has to be considered. Um, I guess, look, we, we'll watch this space, you know, but for the moment, our, our sympathies and thoughts are with uh, the player and we just hope that um, he recovers as fast and as best that he possibly can. Um, just a couple of points from last weekend. I don't want to dwell too much on the games now because we're at midweek and we might just look forward to this weekend. But Donald, Ben Healy from Munster on Sunday. Talk to me. It, uh, you said to me after that so you are very impressed by what he did. Munster played really well, you know, as, as a unit. Um, but is this guy pushing Joey Carberry for starting place this weekend against Conk, do you think? Uh, well, I think he definitely has to come into the equation. Um, look, we saw cameos of Ben Healy last year, um, most of the time coming off the bench, uh, cameos with 20 minutes to go. Uh, we know the basics of his game are very solid. I mean, his kicking out of hand is phenomenal. Place kicking, he's, he's, he's a 50-metre-plus guy, on, depending on conditions. Uh, so, therefore, for a young player at all, 
uh, your development surrounds your ability to manage a game. Um, he started against Bennett on his first start away, as I think March or April last year, um, and the game didn't have a great game. Didn't go well for him. He was taken off, I think, about fifty-five minutes, and and Munster squeezed the victory. JJ Hanrahan dropped a goal, I think, with a minute to go to win that game. So almost a lot of the progress that he made last year, I would say he would have been disappointed given um, that particular match. What we've seen since, he came off the bench in the two opening games, uh, Sharks and Stormers, was really confident. I think physically has developed even more. Uh, We saw him in front of our commentary position for Munster's 10-metre line. Yeah. imploring Peter O'Mahony to give him a shot at goal and, and Peter scratching his head wondering, what are you talking about? Um, it's amazing think, what a good haircut will do for a fella, don't isn't it? It makes what a good exactly. positive will do for a fella's confidence. <laughs> the minute he got rid of that fucking wig he has. <laughs> but I have to say, right from the outset, you know, I covered a piece, I think, on Against the Head Monday night, three minutes. Uh, in my third live commentary, first uh, 20, uh, 50 22 that I saw, it was obviously pre arranged, a reverse pass off a scrum. A yeah. beautiful diagonal kick into the corner from that line-out. Munster set up the field position from whence uh, Jack O'Sullivan got a great try. That's four or five minutes into the game. A couple of minutes later, uh, I thought a, a, a poor tackle from Garrett Davis flying through the air. He almost halves him. And, you know, that's the type of attention that any 10 is going to get in the modern game. What impressed me, he bounced up on his feet straight away, got back in the line and was back in action couple of brilliant passes off his left hand, uh, place kicking, line kicking as strong as ever. Um, uh, the way the game progressed, I mean, Johan van Gran and his wildest dreams couldn't have thought Munster would come away with such a dominant uh, picture. I think the fact that he was taken off at 15 minutes to go, obviously Munster had the game won. There was also an element that I would imagine that they wanted to get 15 minutes into Jack Crowley to give him some exposure. But I think there was maybe a, also an element at the back of Van Grand's head that with a six-day turnaround, that he is now contending for that starting position with Joey Carberry against Cardiff because, uh, to be fair, Joey has started both games and, you know, I would say is, was, was way short of where he had been at the height of his powers. He's still a work in progress. So that'll be an interesting selection on, on Saturday evening. And, you know, it's, you know, I'm looking at this Garland's team here. Like, they had all their Wales internationals back. You know, they had Samson Lee, they had Shingler there, uh, Garrett Davis. Um, so, like, it wasn't a second string Scarlet's team. And Munster ran them absolutely ragged. And you know me, I'm very risk averse. I don't believe in throwing young lads in willy nilly here, but Wales is gone. Birch, maybe you can take this one up. Um, in terms of, of, of how realistic it is for Healy to start ahead of Carberry, given Carberry really hasn't played that well, where are we actually thinking in terms of Johan Van Grand's thinking? Look, I think um, Joey hasn't been as, as good as he can be. I look back at that Stormers game because um, I, I ended up, I went for a few pints with the Stormers coaches and they thought that their line speed really spooked Joey, right? Uh, and I, I wasn't I wasn't sure if they were right or not. So I went back and had a look at it and I actually didn't... It, look, he got, he got under pressure a little bit, but it wasn't just him under pressure. The, the forwards, when you look back at that first half, the forwards were getting met behind the gain line. You know, they were getting smashed back in the tackle. So he was on the back foot to a certain extent. And the way Joey plays, he needs to be getting gain line carries from, from people around him. And uh, when he doesn't, then he doesn't have the kicking game that Ben Healy has. So um, and I think what Ben Healy, Ben Healy showed me a side to his game uh, on, on Sunday in the Scarlets in terms of his passing ability and, and his ability to get a back line moving, which... I wasn't. I hadn't seen at that level before. But again, he was on the front foot. We have to take that into account. Is he pushing Joey Carberry? Absolutely. Does he offer a different um, skill set? Absolutely. Like, there's no one in Ireland who has the the range of goal kicking or um, the accuracy and length that he has in his in his kicking armory, um, and that's going to be valuable. So I, I think there is pressure on Joey this week against and- against. Con- I'd imagine he start against Connor, but he, he he does need to start hitting some form because yeah. You know, Van Graham would have to reward Healy. Yeah, and that's it. I think, you know... <clears throat> I think, sorry, Hugh, just on, on selection, the, the way the modern game goes with sort of six-day turnarounds, uh, in many respects, the team that's going to be playing against Connacht was almost set in stone before the Scarlets game at all because yeah. they'd have been preparing for that as a block. But that said, you've got to look uh, at some stage and, and 
uh, look at the performances of a lot of those young guys and factor that in. Whether that's going to happen in six days against Connacht or whether it's further down the line, we'll just have to wait and see. But I have no doubt in my mind that uh, Van Graan, Larkham, Graham Rowntree came away from Party Scarlets a lot with, you know, a, a, maybe even more confident than the capacity of some of those lads to play uh, than they had in advance, albeit with the caveat that Scarlets, for the experience they had, were really very poor. And, you know, I think they're, they're looking at a trip to Leinster next week. So that'll be interesting from their point of view. Absolutely. Um, Jack Carty is going to start for 10. I can't bar uh, an injury or something happens in the meantime between now and Saturday night. It's live on RT2 television. Um, he's hopeful of, of, of coming into Andy Farrell's reckoning and trying to push for, I guess, more thoughts on him coming into Ireland as a 10 option. And this is what he had to say to RT Sports, Neil Tracy, about the fact that he wants to make, a, I guess, more of a name for himself at international level. Yeah, look, I was obviously there this time, la- yeah, it was this time last year. Um, and I suppose I was in for two weeks and gone. Um, I feel I have a lot to offer still. Um, and I think the fact that we've set ourselves up here in terms of how we're playing, there's a lot of things that the Irish team are trying to do in terms of their setup and attack, especially that marry up with what we're, we're trying to do. So I'd like to think that if... I'm doing these things here from speaking to Faz that um, they'd be able to translate onto the onto the national team. But you know yourself, you have to be playing well and winning games. Um, so just need to be doing that, to be honest. And I'd, I think, I'd like to think that if I'm doing that, then I'd definitely be um, in for a selection. I got on to him and to be fair to him, he, I sent him a text and he'd, he got back to me within, not, not even lying, say in a, in a minute. Um, and it, was, it wasn't a conversation about where I am or this and that. It was purely on what he wants from his 10s um, in, in attack. And he made it, to be honest, crystal clear for me. And the thing that gives me confidence is the fact that a lot of the things, as I said, we're, we're trying to do in terms of our 10 and how, you know, attack and square and different things like that. I won't get into the ins and outs, but a lot of them are quite similar to what he wants from his 10. So it gives me confidence in knowing the fact that if I'm doing that here, as a direct, you know, correlation between the two, whereas maybe previously before, as a 10, it played quite laterally. Um, and that was, you know, probably the complete opposite in terms of what he was looking for. So uh, in that respect, it's given me confidence in knowing that I can, you know, uh, translate it on a, on a bigger stage. On weeks like this where, like, you've had a disappointing result and you're going into a game against, you know, local neighbour and they're in serious form as well. Is motivation actually easier on weeks like this, or is it still a bit tough to kind of pick yourself up? Uh, I think, oh, look, it's yeah, the motivation thing in Interpros is always going to be there. The thing for us is how we can marry that up into games that aren't there, and that's the, the key thing for us. I think coming in on Monday, <clears throat> it's just, I suppose, the way rugby is. The week previously, you're coming in on Monday and you're kind of, in cloud nine because you put a really good performance in and then you know you finish the game Saturday evening you know you're coming in Monday to be going to be a pretty brutal review but it's just kind of the way uh, life is in, in a rugby environment it's the ups and downs and I think you know once we parked the Dragons game the excitement uh, has been building for the, for this game um, which is what we what we need and then just uh, how would you assess your, your own performances across these opening three games um, I would like to think relatively good um, probably again one or two errors however um, I've been really happy defensively in how I've been going it's been a major um, work on for me and I think it's probably the strongest I've been defensively um, so I'm hoping to, to keep doing that the nature of the game it is teams are looking for access through the through the 10 channel so um, I've been working with Cully um week in like week in, week out doing live tackles and I think that's benefited me on weekends. And um, <clears throat> in terms of overall management of the games, I think the messaging from the coaches here has been um probably the clearest it's ever been for me. Um and instead of it being kind of on the nines and tens to actually manage the game, I, f- I personally feel that there's five or six players who manage the game, which you know takes pressure off of me and kind of enables me to worry about other facets of the game, whether it be attacking the ball or and putting players into holes, which is stuff I enjoy doing. Um, whereas previously before, you know, I would have been kind of trying to manage uh, zones of the pitch. So um, I would like to think I've been going going well. Um, there's still 
areas there that's definitely for improvement um, and hopefully they can just kind of keep going on that upward trajectory. So that's Jack Carty there ahead of this weekend. Um, and he sounds, you know, pretty optimistic that he can feature in Andy Farrell's plans. I guess consistency has been the problem for him. Just Harry Byrne um, got an opportunity to start um, last weekend, uh, Bernard, and he limped off after 20 minutes. He didn't have a great first 20 minutes when he was there. Missed a few kicks of goal that he should have got. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, for a young player, his injury profile has, is already stacking up uh, quite deep. And um, I just wonder if, if, there are, if there are going to be issues here coming down the line. Um, Sexton come on to the pitch and change the game for Leinster highlighting once again that he is by far and away Ireland's best right half at the moment yeah Sexton's form um, since the Harlequins preseason game uh, round one against the Bulls and he was rested for the, for the Dragons game and, and obviously came off the bench he just looks he looks as good a condition as he's ever been in uh, his influence on the games um, has, and maybe it's because Harry and, and, and Ross haven't really you know had a chance to um, impose themselves or 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 play to that level, but he looks absolutely critical to, to Leinster's hopes and probably Ireland as well at the moment, which is yeah. it's testament to him. He's you know he's had a big preseason, obviously not going to the Lions tour, and uh, yeah he's he's dominating games. I think it's too early to say Harry Byrne, you know, has a is a is a, is, is a gamble really. I mean he has had picked up a lot of knocks. I mean he, you know he I think he was supposed to play a Champions Cup game last year. Uh, his back went into warm up and, and it was a late withdrawal. So. He is getting some, um, you know, so, some injuries that are uh, that are, are, are stopping his chance of, of developing, and has seen really how, how good he can be. Um, and, and that's uh, you know, for every player, you, you weigh up the, the injury profile as well. And, and um, he'd obviously have to try and you know get a run of games now, uh, pretty soon this year to to take that take that I suppose perception about him. But he has ability for sure, um, and he's in a good a good school. You know, learning from Sexton, learning from his brother. Learning from Felipe, um, and and you know players like Robbie Henshaw, Gary Ringrose outside him. So I wouldn't worry about his chances developing, but it's just probably a little a little period in his in his in his career where he's just not getting that run of luck to, to be able to back up performances. Yeah, and Donald, like I guess the, the big worry here is if you're Andy Farrell, and you, you you come on, you go to the ODS to watch Harry Burney. He goes off after 20 minutes, not a great 20 minutes as well. Sexton comes on and he does what, what we know he can do at this stage. You know, Andy Farrell is nearly persuading about how good Johnny Sexton is still. But it's the lack of depth in behind that's the issue here. And a key position, it is the key position, really, when you look at how rugby is, is developing and has developed over the last few years. And there's no, there's no strength and depth in behind them. Well, it's, 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 well, I think firstly, hugely frustrating from Harry Byrne because uh, I remember the game that Birch was alluding to. I was doing that with RT Radio. I think it was Montpellier in the Champions Cup in the RDS and uh, looking forward to watching Harry Byrne play. He gets injured in the warm up and, uh, um, you know, a, a chance gone. And every, every time these young fellas are handed that opportunity, you know, the, there is pressure on them to perform. So I'd say that, look, nobody more frustrating than him. Andy, uh, Andy Farrell, uh, look, he doesn't need any convincing in terms of where Johnny Sexton lies in the pecking order. But uh, you go back to July and, you know, he left Sexton out of the, rightly so, gave him this full summer off uh, for the games against Japan and the USA. The likes of um, Harry Byrne got to go that time, uh, Billy Burns in Ulster. Um, but again, he wouldn't have come away from that experience thinking that they were ready to play against the All Blacks next November. And that's what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, so it is hugely frustrating from that point of view. Uh, Joey Carberry's uh, setbacks over the past number of years. Um, there's a massive void there. And you go back to the 2019 World Cup and the game against New Zealand. And you'll remember, you know, I spoke to uh, Graham Henry, who was also doing some television work for New Zealand. And he kind of scratched his head when there was a couple of fellas he was surprised were still playing for Ireland, but he did. Uh, he did mention Johnny Sexton. He was amazed that he was still Ireland's number one ten at the nineteen World Cup. I hate <laughs> if I meet him in the twenty twenty three World Cup in in France, and uh, Johnny is still holding out to that jersey. <laughs> you just wonder what he's going to say. But uh, listen, yeah. it's uh, Sexton has no. He's been given the summer off. He's put the frustration of the Lions behind him. He reminds me at the moment that every day is a bonus. He's, you know, you don't often see Johnny Sexton, you, you can't accuse him of playing with a smile in his face, but what we've seen from the season so far, he looks as if he's absolutely reveling in the season. I think he's loving the challenge that none of these other guys are standing up and putting the pressure on him 
that he put on Ronan O'Gara at the same stage of their careers a number of years ago. That's not Johnny Sexton's fault. No, but Ireland are paying the price for it, Donald. I mean, look, it's it, and I don't know who's who's at fault here. I mean, are we just really unlucky that no out half has put their head up to say or their hand up to say, I am the guy to take over here? Is it is it, you know, is it unfortunate or is this, you know, poor succession planning that we have not brought a ten <coughs> to do to challenge Johnny Sexton for the jersey? And I was there with you at Graham Henry and I was laughing, you know, he was making the point, right? I can't believe you're two, you're seven, you're fifty. Like he was rounding off four or five jerseys that shouldn't have been near the World Cup in, in 2011. If Sexton comes back, he'll, he'll just think it's some sort of practical joke, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, as I say, it's up to the others to uh, to take, you know, the challenge for that jersey. You talk about succession plan. There was a succession plan. Uh, Paddy Jackson was very much part of that and uh, for issues that were aware of that didn't transpire. Yeah. Uh, Joey Carberry, but for injury, he was lined up to challenge Sexton at the last World Cup. I think the middle ground behind them, the Ross Burns, the, the Billy Burns, they've been given their opportunities, but on the evidence of what we've seen, I think they're a level short of the top quality international. Yeah. The, the key like element say, for me, yeah. the key element for me is going to come in the November internationals. What would New Zealand do? They throw in the, the younger guys. We've seen it right throughout the rugby championship. Yeah. They chopped and changed their sides, gave opportunities to younger players against the best teams in the world. We tend to do that against the USA's or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Georgia or Japan. We don't take the chance in the really big games when you want to find out, are they up to this or not? Um, we know for all kinds of financial reasons it doesn't happen in the Six Nations. Surely there comes a time if you really want to see how good a young fella is, put him in against New Zealand. You'll find out very quickly. Yeah, you certainly will. Um, Wes had to dash off here. He said there was a there was a sale on men's leggings and tights. There was a <laughs> shot. So he's gone. He's hoovered up all the stockings. You're back with us, Wes. We're talking about ten succession planning here. Uh, you know, look, I I I'm, I'm with Donald here, like in terms of throwing lads in, you know, in the uh, at the highest level and see if they sink or swim. I guess you know we've thrown Billy Burns in, we've thrown Ross Byrne in. I mean, we know we know what they're capable of now. There's a ceiling there, whether they want to admit that or not. Everyone can see him for what it is. Uh, maybe Ben Healy might be our best chance or, or, or Joey Carby coming back to form. That's, that's the way we're looking at it. Yeah, sorry. I'm back on the phone here from my uh, overpriced South Dublin hovel where I can't get internet <laughs> connection. Um, uh, God bless the Celtic Tiger. But um, anyway, on, on the tens, I actually agree with Donal and I, I generally would have a lot of problems with the, the kind of narrow player pathway in Ireland. But I do think they've been very unlucky with regards to what would have been their succession plan a number of years ago, obviously, Paddy Jackson and, and Joey Carberry would have been central to it. And for one reason or another, um, neither has come to fruition yet. Um, that middle ground, I don't think, is going to be the long-term solution to, to Johnny, the, the guys who are kind of one and two in provinces now. Um, I think it'll be from, I've said it before, I think it'll be a next generation of guys. And without having a huge amount of evidence, a handful of games or so, um, the, the one that would excite me the most would, would be would be Jack Crowley, I think. Yeah, yeah, me too. I'm um, 100. Right, lads. Um, we'll we'll leave it up for there for this weekend. Just Munster Connacht this weekend. Can I give quick thoughts on from all of you on how you think it's going to go? Birch Munster Connacht. Uh, would you be look at? I expect the backlash from 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 Connacht. Um, you know they they need to show to show um, uh, some serious resilience to go down there. Um, I, I still think Munster will be good enough to win, but I would expect a far better performance for Connacht. They, losing that game last weekend to Dragons, uh, even though the Dragons are, are, are a far better side this year, it's really going to cost them. I mean, they, they need to make the sports ground a fortress. They've mm -hmm. blown that opportunity, so they need to try and go and get something on the road now, but I don't think Toma Park is the, is the place to get it. Wesley, um, last thing I'm going to say is that he, he'd never admit this on the air, but Donald told me on Sunday afternoon over a pint that the cookies are absolutely flying this year and they fully deserve to be con. What do you think of that, Ben? What do you think of that? Yeah, way? and play, playing very expensive rugby by the looks of it as well. So, uh... yeah. Ex uh, sorry, expensive rugby, is it? Oh, sorry, expensive rugby. Um, oh, sorry. 
I don't know. Like, I mean, Donald was making the point a while back that we're a hurling county now. So, geez, if we ever turned our attention to rugby, we'd be fair hard to stop, you know? Yeah, what? Yeah. Who'd have yeah. Well, if, if, hey, if, if, if you could start by getting a couple of Limerick fellas on the Munster team, to be honest. Yeah. It was only the four in the back line there on Sunday, all right? Yeah. <laughs> right, lads. Uh, pleasure as always. Uh, short and sweet this week, but we are looking forward to the games this weekend. RT2 Television. And Munster against Connacht on Saturday night and Friday night as well. Ulster against the Lions live from Ravenhill in Belfast. Enjoy the rugby. Talk to you next week. The RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com.